I have come a long way. I was born in the Wild West and worked my way to the top. I am the new president of the United States of America. I have sworn to stop the spread of slavery. All men shall be free, whether rich or poor, white or black. To do all which may achieve and cherish a just and a lasting peace. It is a cause worth dying for. I am determined to see this battle through. Even if I get caught in the line of fire myself, I am prepared to put my own life at stake. For I know the dream of freedom for every man will outlive me. A great divide threatens America. Tensions between the North and the South erupt into a bloody civil war. Seceding from the Union, Southerners take up arms to defend their independence and their right to own slaves. America is a ticking bomb. Whenever I hear anyone arguing for slavery, I feel a strong impulse to see it tried on him personally. As a young boy, Abraham Lincoln saw people shackled and beaten because of the color of their skin. America, the land of the free, is the only civilized Christian country where slavery still exists. But beating the body of a human destroys his soul. I could hardly bear to watch it. Their ancestors were carried off into slavery from Africa. Now already four million blacks suffer at the hands of southern slave owners. They are treated no better than the animals which they use to work the cotton plantations. Even their children are sold at slave markets. Those who deny freedom to others deserve it not for themselves, and under a just God can no longer retain it. I was born on February 12, 1809, in Kentucky, a dangerous place to live with bears and other wild animals in the woods. My mother died when I was nine years old. Soon afterwards, my father married a widow with three children. She was a caring woman and gave me books to read. It was my task to cut down trees with a heavy ax from morning until evening. I went to school for just 300 days. 40 years later, while campaigning for the presidency, Abraham Lincoln tells his life story to a newspaper. A young boy from the country teaches himself how to read with the help of the Bible. He is compassionate and determined to fight against injustice. He wants to make a difference. The advent of the steam train accelerates America's westward expansion. But settling the west requires pioneers, not slave owners. The south is less enterprising than the north. 
As a young attorney, Lincoln represents the railroad companies. He strongly believes that America's many immigrants can be united as one new nation. The railroad not only spans the vast expanses of the country, it also sets the pace of a new era. Between 1850 and 1860, an extensive railroad network is developed in the north, while in the more rural south, fewer cities are connected by rail. The railroad brings progress. Slavery enters it. Even as a 20-year-old general store clerk, before becoming a lawyer, Abraham Lincoln understood this. He devoted himself to studying in the evenings after work. I enjoyed selling salt and tools to the settlers and delivering newspapers. But I wanted to do more in life. When the shop closed for the day, I stayed up late reading. Legal texts and books on American history were my favorites. I even learned some by heart. In 1837, Abraham Lincoln moves to Springfield, the capital of Illinois. He is now 28 years old. All of his belongings fit into two saddlebags. He has taught himself all he knows and has qualified to practice as a lawyer. Still, with barely a penny to his name, he shares a bed with a friend, as was common in those days. He soon becomes a partner in a law office. I feel I've already achieved a lot. But I really want to make a difference and make my mark in the world. At the same time, I also dream of having a family. I want to have children and set up a home for them. At a ball, he falls in love with Mary Todd, the daughter of a rich Kentucky slave owner. The poor attorney from the prairie is not welcome in her distinguished family, not least because of his political opinions. But Mary follows her heart. She admires his ambition and believes that one day he will achieve great things. They marry in 1842 and go on to have four children. Mary becomes Lincoln's most trusted advisor. She is well educated and speaks fluent French. Through her, Lincoln is introduced to higher social circles. They are an ideal couple, yet surprisingly, there isn't a single photo of them together. Friends gather frequently at their house, many of them opponents of slavery. In 1852, a novel is published that stirs the country up like no other book of its time. Uncle Tom's Cabin tells the story of a Kentucky slave who is to be set free, but his owner encounters financial difficulties. Powerless, the slave is sold to a brutal plantation owner who works him to death. The book moves Lincoln deeply. In the wake of its publication, the slave issue comes to a head. More and more states support slavery. Lincoln decides to get more involved with politics. Together with like-minded people, he helps found the Republican Party. A small town a day's ride away from Washington captures the attention of the North. Harper's Ferry has an important railway junction and a large military armory. Radical abolitionists raid the armory, intending to use the weapons to launch an insurrection and liberate the slaves. But the group is caught by the army and hung soon afterwards. The North wants peace, not provocation. But the South sees the attack as a Northern conspiracy against its freedom.
Lincoln has his own view on the matter. As a firm believer in the rule of law, he doesn't want to interfere with the Constitution, which allows slavery in the South. Personally, however, he strongly opposes slavery. He wants to change things. He decides to run for Congress in Washington and wins a seat from Illinois. The Springfield attorney is a master of words. He often quotes from the Bible and the works of William Shakespeare. In 1855, Lincoln makes a failed run for the Senate. Two years later, he makes a second attempt. The little-known congressman loses once again, this time to a local hero who already sees himself as a potential president. But his party persuades him to continue. They believe he is the man that can save the Union. A speech he gives in Springfield against the division of the Union suddenly makes him a political star. A house divided against itself cannot stand, he proclaims to his fellow Republicans on June the 16th, 1858. I took these words from the New Testament. The Bible is a great source of inspiration to me. I'm convinced that slavery and democracy cannot coexist indefinitely. We must make a choice. Lincoln's House Divided speech paves his way to the White House. Two years later, he runs for president. Then let us stand 1860, during his election campaign, Lincoln is attacked by the South as a friend of the niggers. But northern votes tip the scales in Lincoln's favor. Makes might. And in that faith, let us dare to do our duty. He has finally made it to the top. He is the new president of the United States of America. But there is no time to celebrate. The country is on the brink of war. No matter how difficult a decision might be, we must not lose sight of our common goal. Lincoln travels to Washington under high security. A plot to assassinate him is thwarted at the last minute. At the White House, Lincoln keeps the black housekeeping staff of his predecessor. But he has no time to settle in. In the aftermath of his election, seven of the 15 slave states had already seceded. The map of America shows the battle lines being drawn. The northern states have elected a president who opposes slavery. In response, the South secedes from the Union, establishing a confederation with their own president. Lincoln, as the lawfully elected president, will not recognize this. If worst comes to worst, he must respond with military action. One last time, he reaches out to the South. In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine is the momentous issue of civil war. The government will not assail you. You can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors. We are not enemies, but friends. Today with no mental reservation. On a cold winter's day no in March 1861, 30,000 people come to hear Lincoln's inaugural address. The new president chooses his words carefully. Against his own convictions, he even agrees to accept slavery where it already exists, if that's what it takes to hold the nation together. The southern states ignore his appeals. Five weeks later, on April 12, 1861, Confederate soldiers fire on Fort Sumter, a military garrison in South Carolina. This severs the ties between the North and the South. Now the two sides will let their weapons make their case. The Civil War has begun. 
The first months of the war are a catastrophe for the North. The troops of the rebelling southern states are well managed, while the North's battalions are poorly trained and disorganised. The South fights fiercely for its independence. The North has difficulty recruiting enough soldiers for Lincoln's cause. But soon the tables turn. Despite its initial success, the South is unable to hold back Lincoln's troops. For two long years, they battle to a deadly stalemate. There are victims in every family. Even Lincoln's own family is deeply divided. Two of Mary's brothers die fighting for the South. Lincoln has aged rapidly. He has lost many friends and urgently needs a break. On a hill overlooking Washington, next to the old soldier's home cemetery, lies his summer residence. It's as modest as the man himself. This is the house where he can feel at home. It is full of personal memories, much different from his official residence, the White House, which he calls the Iron Cage. Lincoln suffers from severe depression. The longer the war goes on, the worse his condition becomes. It's not just the many victims of the war that cause the president such distress. The previous summer, his son Willie died of typhoid fever at the age of 12. Willie is the second child that Abraham and Mary have lost. Now only two sons remain, Robert and Tad. Robert is now 20 years old. He's a student at Harvard and rarely comes home. Only Tad still lives with his parents. His presence helps hold the Lincoln's marriage together. Mary's grief over the death of their two children has estranged her from her husband. She seems to occupy her own world and her wealthy background becomes more and more of an issue. To the distress of modest Abe, she spends more money than her husband earns. She likes to keep up with the latest fashion and spends lavishly on dresses, hats and fabric. This is where I made my most important political decision in the summer of 1862. It's like my old writing desk from Springfield. Here I boldly declared the liberation of slaves as the new means for ending the war. If my name ever goes down in history, it will be for this act. And my whole soul is in it. The Emancipation Proclamation, in which he delivers a death blow to slavery, becomes the most important document of the Civil War. Lincoln has learned to be firm. The presidential decree makes compromise with the South impossible, fanning the flames of the Civil War. New battalions are drawn up. The promise of freedom for all blacks has won Lincoln the support of urgently needed fresh troops on the battlefields. 180,000 black men fight in their own segregated regiments for the cause of the Union and for their own fate. The railroad allows the North to assert its technological superiority. With it, soldiers and cannons can be transported quickly throughout the country. New railway lines are built across America. Battlefields are often located strategically close to the tracks, near the newly built towns springing up along these highly trafficked routes. 
The railroad is critical in determining the outcome of the war. Gradually, the North gains the upper hand. The southern states are forced on the defensive. Their troops lose more and more ground. In a risky military strategy, they attempt to close in on the armies of the North by using enormous deployments. But sabotaging the railway lines is often more effective. Horrific battles take place. In the summer of 1863, the two sides square off near the small town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Eight thousand men die in three days. Thirty thousand are wounded. The Battle of Gettysburg is the turning point of the war, a bloody symbol of the sacrifice President Lincoln demands for the unity of the nation and the liberation of the slaves. That November, four months after the battle, the President travels to Gettysburg to dedicate a military cemetery. He travels in the same train that carried Confederate dead and wounded from the battlefield. He has chosen each word carefully. In only 10 sentences, he describes his vision of a new America and pays his respects to the victims of the war on both sides. With the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln once again makes history crafting a speech that will echo beyond his own country and time. That we highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation shall have a new birth of freedom, and that this government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. On the outside, Lincoln is calm and composed, Yet inside, he is in turmoil, consumed by the unceasing carnage of the war. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now, we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that the dead of Gettysburg. For the first time in history, the brutal consequences of war are documented by a camera. The man behind many of these images is Alexander Gardner. Gardner is also the president's personal photographer. Lincoln often calls on him at his studio near the White House. Lincoln is well aware of the impact of these photos. They show a determined and just man, a stern and serious leader. But not everyone views the president favorably. This man's appearance, his pedigree, his coarse jokes and anecdotes, his vulgar similes and his policy are a disgrace to the seat he holds. He is the tool of the North to crush out or try to crush out slavery by robbery, slaughter, and bought armies. A false president yearning for a kingly succession. John Wilkes Booth despises President Lincoln. A southern-born pro-slavery fanatic, Booth is one of the most famous actors in America. He has performed in the country's best theaters, in both the North and South. Yet for many months now, he has not had any acting engagements. He is often drunk, an actor desperately searching for a starring role. Bore me on his back a thousand times now. 
Oh, boy. In my imagination it is. My gorge rises at it. Yeah, hung those lips that I have kissed, I know not how often. Get you to my leader's chief and tell her that I'll paint an inch thick. The past few days have been the worst of his life. The South is facing imminent defeat. And Lincoln has decided to run for a second term as president. John Wilkes Booth had given his first great performance in Richmond, now the capital of the Confederacy. Success came with Shakespeare roles. His father was a famous Shakespearean actor who had emigrated from England to the slave state of Maryland and started a family there. John is especially close to his sister, Asia. His brothers are his rivals, battling for their father's rare praise. Hey! Put those down! Get inside! Junius Brutus Booth does not want his children to become stage performers. The eccentric father runs the family with an iron fist. But he provides them well with his performances on the stages of the North. Against his will, all three sons become Shakespearean actors. For Booth, the death of his domineering father is liberating. More than once, he has dreamt of killing the family tyrant. In time, he will seek to liberate America from a man he sees as another tyrant. On rides from the White House to his summer residence, President Lincoln often travels without his bodyguards. Nothing will prevent me from living as long as it takes to complete my work. God will protect me. He keeps watch over me. The stray bullet of a hunter. Not worth mentioning. It would only worry Mary. But all the same, the bullet has made a hole in his new top hat. The trademark of the people's president, Abe Lincoln. When the war is over, I will finally get around to reading once again. And we'll go over to the theater with Mary. Something by Shakespeare, my favorite playwright. He's always been good for my speeches. Cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never tasted death but once. Such powerful words, and so true. Peace at last. It's good to have some time to myself. I could strike now. It would be child's play. The people in the North are tired of the unexpectedly long and bloody war. There will soon be elections again. We must win this war. Otherwise, the people will vote in a different president, and all this work and bloodshed will be in vain. Little does Lincoln know that he is faced with a far greater concern. I will wait until I have gathered an audience that will admire me for my awe-inspiring act. I 
I will also need accomplices to help me carry out my plan. Someone was here. Who managed to creep up so close to this house in broad daylight? Even if there are several incidents that should leave Lincoln worried, he's too caught up in planning his election campaign to give them much thought. In the saloons south of Washington, you a man Booth boasts of a performance he is planning to stage. No, 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 no. You know, Caesar, Brutus, all of that. Ah, sure. My performance will be Shakespeare, but bigger. A climax that this country will not soon forget. Uh -huh. No one takes the actor seriously. Drink, you must have one with me. Yeah? He goes on about the tyrant Caesar, his murderer Brutus, too, and the greatest show America will ever boys, see. On me. Thank you, sir. Yeah. You're my boys. Your performance, good sir. He can hardly my bear the Yankee soldiers, up. so You're confident of their victory. Thank you. Don't you? Thank you. November 1864. With the Union Army now sweeping through the South, Abraham Lincoln is elected to a second term in the White House. He gains even more votes than four years earlier, winning the support of 80% of his soldiers. This time, the South does not cast its vote. Lincoln knows the Union will win the war, yet he must wait to celebrate the victory. First, he must reunite the North and the South, while still guaranteeing the liberty of the newly freed slaves. The president is tormented by nightmares. He describes one in a diary entry from March 1865. I heard muffled sobbing as if several people were crying. I went downstairs, but the mourners were invisible. In front of me, there was a coffin in which there lay a body wrapped in shrouds. It was surrounded by guards. Who died at the White House? I asked one of the soldiers. The president was his reply. He was assassinated. Abraham Lincoln starts his second term as president. In his inaugural address, he uses words of reconciliation. Photographer Alexander Gardner documents the occasion. To finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Yet among the crowd assembled before him are some who want revenge, not reconciliation. There, captured by chance in a photograph by Alexander Gardner, are John Wilkes Booth and his accomplices. They have been meeting secretly at a guest house in Washington. The house belongs to Mary Surratt, a woman who had owned a tobacco plantation and slaves in Maryland, but lost almost everything because of her alcoholic husband. Booth's gang includes David Herald, who knows the South like the back of his hand, Ford Theatre employee Edmund Spangler, Lewis Powell, whom they call Payne, a hulk of a man feared for his brutality, and George Atzerod, who rounded out the group. They meet in Booth's room, where they devise a plan to kidnap the president and save the South from certain defeat. Escape routes are scouted out, and a hideout is prepared. Together, they are a rough lot. Alcohol leads to frequent skirmishes. Booth uses his savings to finance the group. He demands unconditional obedience. What he does not tell his comrades 
is that he intends to assassinate, not kidnap the president. Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy, lies in ruins. On April 9th, 1865, the South surrenders. Lincoln has restored the Union at an unspeakable price. More than 600,000 soldiers and 50,000 civilians have paid for it with their lives. Lincoln is eager to announce that black soldiers will soon be granted civil rights. Surrounded by the dead, he swears that all Americans will soon live in freedom. Shortly after the surrender, Lincoln pays a visit to Alexander Gardner's studio. Mr. President, if you could please, uh, over here toward my hand just a little bit. Wonderful, wonderful. I am happier than I have ever been in my entire life. The wounds will soon heal when America has come to fully understand what we have done. Through the lens, the image of the president appears upside down. Photography is a relatively new invention. It works by exposing lights to a delicately laminated glass plate, which is attached to the back of the camera. Mr. President, if you could please hold still for just one minute. We are off. Lincoln must sit still for several seconds so the photo doesn't blur. Citizenship for niggers. By God, I'll show him. Well, the great thing about this camera is the, uh, it doesn't take very long to do. Oh, here we are, Mr. President. Thank you, Charles. After the photo is taken, so the plate see, must lie in a developing bath for several hours before the picture appears. Ready for you by the end of the day. While drying the plate, Gardner makes a mistake. The glass plate breaks. A crack across an exhausted face. His previous determination seems to have disappeared. This is the last photograph of Abraham Lincoln. John Wilkes Booth knows the tavern south of Washington, where the Confederate secret police often stayed. It will make for an ideal spot for a cache of weapons, which he knows he will later need when he is on the run. What a glorious opportunity there is for a man to immortalize himself by killing Lincoln. The ambitious fool who fired the Ephesian dome outlives in fame the pious fool who reared it. Booth is on the road for days, making his final preparations. He travels deep into Virginia, where he plans to go into hiding once the mission is accomplished. Worn out, the defeated Southern soldiers slowly return home. Lincoln immediately releases all prisoners of war. They all know their humiliating defeat spells more than the end of slavery. It means the end of an entire way of life. And the dawn of a new era. On April 13th, President Lincoln returns from his summer residence. That evening, Washington celebrates the end of the war. The following day is Good Friday. Lincoln and his wife Mary have been invited to Ford's Theatre. That evening they will see the comedy, Our American Cousin. 
it seems like a new beginning. Dearest mother, I know that you expect a letter from me and I am sure you will hardly forgive me. I only drop you these few lines to let you know that I am well. Excuse brevity, I am in haste. With best love to you all, I am your affectionate son ever, John. What a wonderful chance I had to kill him, if I had only wanted to. I was so close to him at his inauguration. April 14th, 1865. The Union flag flies once again at Fort Sumter, where the war began. The ships of the victorious North lie at anchor. They too have hoisted the stars and stripes up their masts. Abraham Lincoln is happier than he has been in years. That morning, he calls a cabinet meeting to celebrate. Since the president is a teetotaler, only lemonade is served. After the death of his son, Willie, Lincoln did not display his grief publicly. He locked himself away for days to mourn alone. Mary never set foot in the boy's bedroom again. Lincoln, however, often went to look at his son's toys, which had not been moved. What will happen next? It was just over four years ago that he had left Springfield with his suitcases to take office in Washington. That morning, a messenger from the White House arrives at Ford's theater to spread the news that the Lincolns will attend the evening's performance. A box is decorated for the illustrious guests, with flags, a portrait of George Washington, and a comfortable rocking chair for the president. The theater's manager hopes for a full house. As a frequent actor at Ford's Theatre, Booth knows the theatre well and has kept a pigeonhole there, a mailbox that he checks regularly. Oh, the president will be here tonight. Lincoln will be at the theatre tonight? This is the opportunity I have been waiting for. I must think and act quickly. Booth knows the theater inside and out. The rear stage entrance leads to the lower stalls. For the moment, the stage is empty. One of America's most famous actresses, Laura Keene, will be performing tonight. Booth knows that the presidential box is in the dress circle. He had acted in a comedy in front of President Lincoln a few years before. He makes a spy hole in the door of the box. This time he will be starring in his own play. Since 1861, when Lincoln first moved in, the White House has been open to all. Even during the war, anyone could visit the president in his office and with any luck, tell him their worries and troubles. Today, Lincoln hopes to leave early, but first he personally answers a few letters. He wants to drive down to the port with Mary to welcome the warships returning to the Navy Yard on the Potomac River. 
they have a few hours to spare before the theatre performance begins. During the past few years, they have had little time for each other. Lincoln knows that things have to change. Mary has often been in complete despair, on the verge of a nervous breakdown. We must both be more cheerful in the future. Between the war and the loss of our darling Willie, we have both been very miserable. Lincoln had even participated in Mary's seances and tarot card evenings, and would later never forgive himself for encouraging this hocus pocus. He had simply wanted to show her that he understood her profound pain over Willie's death. Not far from the White House, John Wilkes Booth meets with his accomplices for the last time. In one fell swoop, he wants to assassinate the Vice President and the Secretary of State as well. The others are reluctant at first, as they had only agreed to the kidnapping. In the end, he convinces them to go along with his plan. Many will condemn me for what I am about to do, but future generations will thank me for it. Less than two hours remain until the performance. That afternoon, Booth had hired a horse from Howard's livery stables. A price had not been agreed upon, as he hadn't known how long he would need the horse. When Booth returns, he says that it will be ten days. You said ten days? Ten days. Ten days. Ten, fifteen. Same price, though. For you, Mr. Booth? Yes. This is very important. Give this to the newspaper. He hands over a letter Understand? with instructions to take it to a newspaper the next morning. Under no circumstances, he warns, should it be opened before then. The new plan is this. While Booth guns down Lincoln, Lewis Powell will assassinate the Secretary of State and George Atzerod, the Vice President. Booth does not tell them he has mentioned their names in a letter claiming responsibility. Mary and Abe are late. General Ulysses Grant and his wife had been expected to accompany them to the theater, but canceled at the last minute. The two women do not get along. When they arrive at Ford's theater, the performance has already started. For once, the Lincolns are accompanied by a bodyguard. Your vulgarity renders you intolerable in polite society. The comedy is about a rich but rather foolish American who is visiting his aristocratic relatives in England. The play is a crowd pleaser and promises an entertaining evening. But not for everyone. At around 10 p.m., Booth arrives at the rear stage entrance. An accomplice takes care of his horse. <laughs> the bodyguard leaves his post, heading down to the stage to catch a glimpse of Laura Keane. Just as Booth had hoped, a full house. Oh, that accounts for what I've heard so many of the young ladies say. Florence, dear, don't you find Mr. Dunbury? I never knew what they meant before. <laughs> In order not to be seen, Booth uses the upper stage entrance to get to the box. Oh, man, trap. 
He knows the play well, including the exact moments when the audience will laugh and applaud. Only four scenes left until the end. His play is about to begin. Well, surely a villain of Coyle's stability would have destroyed the note. It would have been the very essence of... Shouting sick Semper Tyrannis, thus always to tyrants, Booth races from the theatre, fending off with a knife anyone who stands in his way. Having leapt from the box to the stage, however, Booth has badly injured his leg. Mounting his horse, the legendary actor disappears into the Washington night. Theatre, the president is still alive. Severely wounded, he is carried to a house across the street. Abraham Lincoln, who fought for freedom, now has to fight for his own life. The assassin John Wilkes Booth rides off into the night. He flees to the south. The manhunt begins. <laughs> 